In the previous video, we touched on the architecture that's courtesy of Dr. Harry Porter, as well as a new register and backplane design using an edge card connector. So after many hours of testing, it's looking like everything is running great. And I'm now on to the next card, which is the sequencer. And before I delve into the design of the sequencer, I'm gonna answer a question that I had to ask myself when I started this out, and that is, why do we need a sequencer? Let's start with the clock. And the clock in this computer is pretty much like a clock in any other computer. It's jumping between zero and five volts and back to zero at a regular interval. In this diagram, we can see that each pulse of the clock drives a step on the sequencer. And in this particular case, the sequencer has 10 steps. Each pulse of the clock moves the step one forward. And note that only one step is active at a time. Once the sequencer reaches the last step, it goes back to the beginning, and it will keep doing this sequence as long as clock pulses are received, or somebody shuts the power off. In this simplified view, the output of each sequencer step is first modified through a pulse generator. This generator helps address timing issues specific to a relay computer, but more on this later. The modified timing pulses then go to the instruction controller, which executes the microcode of the current instruction being processed. This microcode directly activates the control lines used to perform the tasks at a hardware level. These control lines directly correspond to most of the pins on our 128 pin bus. Dr. Harry Porter designed an ingenious sequencer circuit that includes the ability to abort or restart the sequencer at different stages, making the computer more efficient when executing simpler instructions. And Paul Law has kindly redocumented those drawings in detail on his blog, and has even provided the schematics and PCB designs for his two-card sequencer. So before I get started on my PCB design for the sequencer, I just have to cover off a few differences between those designs and mine. The first is that I'm using 5 volt instead of 12 volt. Not a big deal. The second thing is that I'm using LEDs that don't have integrated resistors, so I'll just have to wire in my usual resistor networks, and that just means more traces. The third thing is the edge card. That's just a routing issue, so again, not a big deal. But I think the biggest challenge is going to be fitting everything on a single card. And as an example, this is the register from the previous video, and it has 38 relays on it. And you can see that the real estate's a little tight already. We have to add another 20 relays on top of that to get the sequencer on a single card. So this next part is going to be a lot of fun.
The new boards have arrived, they've been unpacked, and I think they look great. I know I'm biased, but the design turned out really, really well from my perspective. I've gone ahead and run some continuity tests on the pins just to make sure that everything is connected to what it should be. And I've also tested all of the relays I'm about to put on this board before I actually put them on the board. And that's just a lesson learned from the previous boards I did. Finding a bad relay after the fact is a challenge. So I just want to make sure that everything's good to go. And then I get to move on to the fun part. present to you the completed sequencer card and it's pretty hefty. It contains 58 relays, 23 diodes, 47 LEDs and somewhere in there is a partridge in a pear tree. That's, that's bad. Um, it's getting late, I should go to bed but I really want to see it work. I'll start with my trusty breadboard and buttons and refer to the schematic to find the connector pins that I'll need to test this new sequencer card. These pins include the reset, the clock, and the four abort latch control lines. And then it's just a matter of hooking everything up and plugging in the board. After pressing the reset line on the sequencer, I can start to cycle the clock and test that the sequencer is going through the steps as it should be. I can then start my testing on the four abort latches. When I press the control line for AT08, the sequencer should stop at step eight and return back to the beginning. And I can then move on to the other abort latches for the 10, 12, and 14 steps. And when everything goes perfectly, it calls for happy thumbs. Now that we have the sequencer working, it's time to catch up on the pulse generator, whose output is on the right, and is driven by these diodes across the bottom of the card. We'll start with our code again, and this time we'll examine what happens when the TAX instruction is executed. The TAX instruction transfers whatever value is in the A register to the X register. This instruction, like every other one, requires hardware microcode that will activate control lines in the appropriate order. This view of the TAX microcode represents the timing of the control line activations needed. Note that both the RSA and LDX control lines need to be activated at the same time, since we are transferring a value via the data bus. When step six of the sequencer is reached, the RSA and LDX lines are activated and they stay activated until the sequencer moves to the next step. Now this all looks good in theory, but our trusty relays are electromechanical devices, and they have much slower and less accurate switching speeds than modern digital electronics. And this problem is only compounded when we are using many relays in tandem. In our example here, there could be a problem during the falling edges when the control lines are deactivated. When the RSA control line is released, the value in the A register is no longer visible on the data bus. If this occurs even milliseconds before the LDX control line has deactivated, 
then the X register would be loaded with a null or zero value from the data bus. So we need a way to ensure that the LDX control line will be released before the RSA line. Now we can't reduce the duration of the LDX activation, but we can extend the RSA control signal one extra step. And to do that, we can use diode logic circuits to create new timing pulses to drive our hardware microcode. So now, the output of sequencer step 6 first enters our diode pulse generator, which in turn activates both the pulse X and pulse Y control lines, which will then drive the RSA and LDX lines as expected. And in the next step, only pulse Y is engaged, and this holds the RSA line active and allows the extra time needed to ensure that the X register has the correct value from the data bus. So this is a no strings or no Arduino attached demonstration. I, I really can't believe I'm at this point already. This is a rudimentary ring counter clock with some hefty capacitors in there just to keep the speeds down for debugging purposes. This board is holding the micro code, I'll call it. So this relay at an earlier step is loading the A register with whatever's on the data bus. And then these two relays represent a transfer instruction. And that transfer instruction is, we'll call it tab in this case, because it's transferring A to B. And these four buttons are just so I can load something onto the data bus so I can control what's being transferred between the registers. So I'm going to power it up. And I'm going to reset the sequencer in here. And then I'm going to start the clock. Also note that this last piece of microcode here is using the abort latch. So once the code is completed execution, its final step is to ensure that the abort latch is set or latched so that it will reset and run back to the beginning. So I'll load some data on here. And now it's in the A register and the microcode has transferred it to the B register. Awesome, this is amazing. So let's have even more fun now. Uh, we're gonna amp up the clock speed using the Arduino. This Arduino setup is just to control the reset and the clock line and this block is used to populate data onto the data bus. And that's just so I can see it cycling through. The code that's running this microcode is still running from these relays here. So really, again, this is really just a, a clock and loading data onto the data bus. So let's start it up and see what happens. All right, no smoke. We're going to speed it up again. And now, turbo mode.
So that's a wrap on the sequencer card. And I'm thankful that it works. I'm even more thankful that I was able to test how many relays I can cram onto a single card. I think that's gonna be something that is a reoccurring theme on this project. And speaking of highly populated cards, the next card that I'm gonna be working on is the incrementer. And for this card, I'm going to deviate a bit on the design and use another type of half adder. I think that this is part of the learning process for me. It'll definitely be extra rewarding if it actually works. I wanted to take a moment to extend my sincere thanks to everyone who not only viewed the last video, but who've provided such positive commentary and feedback. It's highly motivating for me. I had no idea that there were so many other people interested in relay computers. So thank you so much. Please continue to provide any commentary, any suggestions that you have, or even your own adventures in relay computing. And with that, I'll leave off with another ASMR moment.